Welcome to the Bible as Revolution with Vishal Mengelwadi. I'm Dennis McCourt, the founder of God Hope Inc. and host of Kingdom Talk Radio Hour. It's so good to have this important discussion with you, Vishal, as an author, speaker, historian, and philosopher. The subject is homosexuality, Hinduism's philosophical triumph. This series addresses the fostering of the ideology of the LBGTQ plus gender confusion by Hinduism, Monism, Jungian and New Age ideologies. And this cultural clash that's going on in our society, not only in America, but around the world, especially during Pride Month, is something that is being brought to fore right here in our community in Fresno, California, in the center of the state. And just this last week, a so-called pastor got up and prayed this prayer and called God the scandalous one, the ultimate transgressor, the queerer of norms that harm the queer one. So this is an example of the attack on the very foundations of our Western civilization and what it is as far as our very essence as humans and our humanity. And another example of this is this very Friday here in Fresno at the zoo, they are having an event called the Family Friendly Drag Performance, where children can meet and greet with queens and drag queens after the show. And so during this Pride Month, Vishal, we are really grateful to have you discuss this important subject that applies to all of our lives around the world, the subject of homosexuality, Hinduism's philosophical triumph. Well, thank you very much for introducing us. Uh, we are here uh, recording three episodes today. One, I will make a presentation on the theme that during the last 30, 40 years, the triumph of homosexuality, LGBTQ, is really a philosophical triumph of Hinduism. And then I would be very grateful if you question and um, clarify what I have said to viewers who may not understand what I am saying. And then we will have Jerry, the CEO of uh, Harvest TV from South India, uh, question from the perspective of Hindus and Indians, so that in three sessions we really get a grip of what has happened to the West and what needs to be done about it. I'll be honored to participate in that, Vishal. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for listening. My name is Vishal Mangalwadi, and my first book was called The World of Gurus, which is a textbook in many universities. It's a study of Hindu gurus who were very po influential and popular uh, during the 1970s, 80s, followed by the Beatles and Hollywood celebrities and many uh, scholars from around the world. And my second book, When the New Age Gets Old, Looking for a Greater Spirituality, has a chapter on tantric sexuality about which I will be discussing. Both the books have been used at university level and they are both actually sold out we will be soon reprinting them. So, in this first introductory lecture, I want to explain that current homosexuality is Hinduism's philosophical triumph in the West. And uh, the background is these studies that I have written. The heart of what I am saying is very simple, that Hinduism does not believe in the distinction between creator and creation. There is not no dualism of creator and creation. Uh, creator is not a creator, he is a dancer like the dancing sh Shiva, he is the dancer. Dance and the dancer are one. This is called monism which means that all is one, mono means one, all is one. If all is one, then the dualism of male and female is an illusion. In fact, e each one of us has a male and female. 
Now, that is to say that the Bible's view of marriage is different than the Hindu view of sexuality. The basic difference is uh, that in, uh, in the Bible, God says it is not God good for man to be alone. That is the basis of marriage. It is not good for man to be alone because e every individual male or female is finite. I am male, I am not female, I need my wife to be complete. When the two become one flesh, we become three, we have a child and that is what makes us into the image of the triune God. God makes man in his image male and female. He is infinite, we are finite. This is the Bible's essential teaching about sexuality, but the Hindu view is very different and it is that view which has won. How did we get here? Rene Descartes is considered the pioneer of Western enlightenment. He was he lived from 1596 to 1650. He is also the father of what is called rationalism, which is saying that human reason by itself without divine revelation can know the truth. Human reason is sufficient. Uh, Descartes most famous dictum is I think therefore I am because I am thinking I can doubt that God exists, I can doubt that the world exists, I can doubt that you exist, maybe I am dreaming, but I cannot doubt that I exist because that will be self contradictory. I doubt that I exist uh, that will be self contradictory. Whatever is illogical or self contradictory cannot be true. That means I think therefore I am. This was the heart on with the phrase I think therefore I am. He Descartes is arguing that I exist as a soul. How do soul and body interact? Descartes thought that in pineal gland human soul and human body begin to interact. My soul tells my hand to pick up a book and my hand does that. So, the thinker, the decision maker is the human soul and that is what he is proving. From there Descartes goes on to present his argument for the existence of God that God must exist, exist etcetera. But he was succeeded by a number of philosophers. The important one for our purposes was David Hume 1711 to 1776. Descartes was uh, French from Paris who lived, who fled to uh, Amsterdam and did a lot of his writing there. David Hume was a Scottish philosopher who, who came after the Scottish Reformation as part of uh, the Enlightenment movement. He is known as empiricist. Empiricist is one who thinks that the knowledge of truth comes to us, comes to us not through logic, but through senses what we see, what we hear, what we touch, what we smell, what we taste. These uh, physical senses bring in the data which the brain organizes into knowledge. Now, his problem is uh, he shows that uh, Descartes logic is defective, it is false. I think therefore I am is wrong because a robot can think. A robot can translate books, a robot can um, maintain your calendar, take your phone calls, he can tell you all the recipes in the world. He can any question that you want to answer Wikipedia, a robot can answer immediately. Uh, he can solve complex mathematical issues, robot can uh, play a game of chess with you and beat you in that. So, a robot think, does it mean that a robot exists as a person? as a soul, as a self. No, Hume says that what Descartes has proven is that uh, thinking exists. He has not proven that the thinker exists as a person, as a soul. Now, 
when I studied philosophy, I did not know that actually David Hume had studied Buddhism and he was presenting the Buddhist art ideas to demolish Descartes belief in soul. Because if the knowledge of truth comes to us through human senses, then we actually cannot see your soul, I cannot see my own soul, I cannot hear my own soul, I cannot touch or taste or smell my soul. So, soul does not exist, uh, this is uh, Hume argues, but the re following him uh, for 200 years the western thinkers begin to struggle with this that soul must exist, I must exist as a person and Immanuel Kant uh, uh, brings that con uh, whole debate to a grand climax where skepticism becomes part of western philosophy. So, Descartes and Hume have said we can know through logic or through senses, Immanuel Kant is saying no we cannot know, human mind cannot know ultimate reality. So, this is uh, the birth of skepticism which was very important in India it becomes important here in the west. He is followed by the German philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer who uh, uh, agrees with Buddha, um, Schopenhauer and his his successor Nietzsche, they are both great scholars of Buddhism, they both agreed with the Buddha that the human mind cannot prove that God exists or soul exists. So, uh, Arthur Schopenhauer becomes a complete pessimist that the human mind cannot know the truth, soul does not exist. Nietzsche then says, if God is dead, because God is dead means that human mind, human logic has cannot prove God. If we cannot prove God, then perhaps God does not exist. If God is dead means that the truth is dead, spirit is dead, there is no spirit, there is no morality, nothing is absolutely right or wrong. What matters is the will to power. This raises a fundamental question about what is language? Do words have something to do with truth? Can truth be communicated in words? And this is where Ludwig, Ludwig Wittgenstein, who Burton Russell said that he was the uh, uh, greatest philosopher of the 20th century, working in the first half of the 20th century, he, uh, he, he built a uh, system of philosophy called linguistic analysis. And Wittgenstein argued that actually uh, he began with his philosophy by assuming that words can communicate truth, but, con but concluded by saying that words have nothing to do with truth, uh, words cannot communicate the truth, therefore even the Bible cannot communicate truth, uh, because words have nothing to do with truth. This opened the door to mystical experience and the transition was uh, from Sigmund Freud to um, Carl Jung. Sigmund Freud is best known as the father of um, um, uh, psychoanalysis. He was in Vienna and Carl Jung was in Basel in what is in Switzerland, both spoke German and uh, they both began as psychoanalysts. Jung moved on from uh, uh, deviated and I will explain that. This is important because uh, uh, Freud, the father of modern psychoanalysis, uh, he believes that uh, spirit and morals do not exist. So, the enlightenment has led us to a dead end. Descartes is trying to prove that I exist, soul exists, God exists, morals exist but actually that whole experiment over two, two centuries or more has failed. Now, we know that we do not know if God exists, if man exists, if morals are real. Now, that raises a problem because Freud is a therapist. Families are bringing patients to Freud that, sir, here is a person who is demon possessed. He or she changes her behavior, her language, cries a lot or laughs a lot, becomes very violent, very aggressive or completely passive, sleeping for days on end. Please, you are a therapist, uh, uh, cast out these demons from this patient. Now, 
Freud knows that God does not exist, therefore, soul does not exist, therefore, spirits do not exist. If the person is not demon possessed, what is the problem? What is the root cause of this mental disorder? Freud develops a theory of sexual repression that when you are a child, you have sexual desires and urges as you begin to grow up you are not allowed to express those urges and fulfill those urges, you are taught to repress your desire and this sexual repression actually results in mental disorder. Now, in order to assume this, uh, uh, Freud is doing um, dream analysis, patients are sharing their dreams with him he is doing um, a number of uh, uh, exercises including hypnosis etcetera that you uh, put your patient on a couch um, and uh, in, uh, try and get whatever is in the subconscious mind when normally a person will not admit consciously that this is what I am thinking. So, a boy is saying that I am thinking of sleeping with my mother or my sister or girl fantasizing about having sex with her father or uncle or teacher etcetera. So, what is repressed is allowed to be expressed because some of it is in fact expressed in dreams etcetera. So, Freud concludes that human mind has two segment, uh, it is like an iceberg, most of the mind consciousness is under water. Uh, this he calls a uh, personal unconscious mind, the unconscious mind. Out of that comes consciousness which is shaped by society, it has to be moral, it has to be logical, it has to be rational, though in my dreams I am free to be irrational and illogical. So, this consciousness for Freud, because we are only chemistry, we are only brain. A brain is a uh, thought or consciousness is a um, product of brain chemistry. Out of the, what is happening in my brain and the ideas that are coming to birth, personal unconsciousness, rational consciousness emerges. So, that is the tip of the iceberg which is above the water which everybody sees and hears and reads when I write something I am using my um, conscious mind, but below that there is a whole personal unconscious. Now, because Carl Jung was the number one disciple when the whole academic world was attacking uh, Freud understanding that Freud is calling for a sexual revolution, that sexual desire should not be repressed, but should be expressed. Uh, everyone was against Freud, but uh, Jung defended Freud's theories publicly and therefore, he became the heir apparent and Freud said to Jung that you are my successor, you are the leader, next leader of the psychoanalytic movement, please promise me that you will never give up the theory of sexual repression as the root of mental disorders. Uh, Jung thought about it and he asked Freud and I am paraphrasing uh, that, uh, sir do we really have hard scientific data that every individual's mental disorder is caused by sexual repression? Is our theory truly scientific? So, meaning you had this lady on your uh, therapy couch yesterday, she was there a week ago and a week earlier. Uh, and you have analyzed her, can you say that her mental disorder are a result of sexual repressions for reasons A, B, C, D which you have documented. Freud is honest and says no, we do not have hard scientific data, but the only alternative to explain these mental disorders is spirit possession that this patient is demon possessed. And we know of course, that demons do not exist, soul do not exist because God does not exist, spiritual realm does not exist. Therefore, 
we cannot accept that occult explanation. We have to teach our theory of sexual repression as the source of mental disorders. Uh, we have to teach it as a scientific dogma. That is the phrase Freud uses that we have to teach this as scientific dogma. But Jung, his father was a pastor, he is an honest scientist and he says that look, you are admitting that you do not have hard scientific data for your theory, but you want it to be tossed as scientific truth, scientific dogma. You are actually the one who is believing in, in an occult science, a science for which there is no evidence which cannot be proven. Your worldview is occult and you are blaming the church uh, which believes in demon possession and exorcism etcetera uh, to be uh, occultist. So, Jung then rejects Freud and he moves forward uh, to raise tough question what is language? Why can one language be translated into all other language? What is logical? What is logic? Where does logic come from? What is music? What is beauty? What really are dreams? And do we have dreams in common? Now, Freud and Jung used to share their personal dreams with, with each other and have them interpret. So, uh, Jung shares some of his dreams to Freud and Freud uh, interprets those dreams, but uh, Jung realizes that these interpretations are not really doing justice to who I know I am and what I know I am. And then he goes, goes on to build on Freud's theory of unconscious mind to think of a collective unconsciousness that all human beings share one and the same basic consciousness. That is why language works, logic works, notions of beauty and goodness and truth work etcetera. So, he develops his theory. Now, as Jung is developing his theory, he realizes that he is coming very close to Hindu idea of Brahma. There is one collective unconscious mind, infinite consciousness Brahma, which includes male and female and Jung calls it anima and animus. These are principles, uh, male and female principles within each one of us and uh, uh, this is now what I am suggesting in a few moment very close to uh, tantric physiology. In tantric physiology uh, has said the same thing of anima and animus in very different language that in the human body there are seven psychic centers, they are called chakras. At the base of the spine is the female energy that is called kundalini. Normally in a man female energy is dormant. They say that it is lies coiled up as a serpent. You have to awaken that serpent power. The other name for the female energy is serpent power in tantra. So, you awaken that serpent power and it begins to move up through the seven chakras psychic centers and as it begins to move up you have many mystical experiences your consciousness goes haywire as in uh, drug experiences or in hallucinations etc. Finally, the female Shakti uh, uh, Kundalini merges with the male uh, which is Shiva chakra, crown chakra on top of your head and when male and female which are present within each one of us merge, we become infinite. We have this mystical experience of collective unconsciousness of Brahma, we become God. So, self realization or God realization happens uh, with the merger of dualism back into monism or oneism. Now, these ideas remain in the academic world. The Jung actually went to India in 1936 uh, to study Hinduism, uh, although he had already developed his theories uh, before going to India. Uh, but it was 
the Indian philosopher Osho Rajni, she began as Achara Rajni, she was actually a professor of philosophy in the same state where I was born and then uh, he uh, resigned from his uh, teaching position to become a religious teacher. Initially, he was called Bhagwan, um, which means God with small g. Later, he called himself Osho Rajneesh and he was expelled from India because of all the controversies about the sexual experiments and perversion that were going on in his ashram. Uh, his most famous book, uh, I mean, he, he, he has written more books than anyone else. Every lecture he gave was turned into a book. Uh, but his uh, the, philosophically his most famous book was from sex to super consciousness by super consciousness he means divine consciousness that uh, through sexual intercourse through sexual experience sexual mysticism uh, which uh, the Greeks called gnosticism through sexual uh, uh, experience we when male and female become one so he used Christ saying that you have to be born again in order to enter the kingdom of God. What does it mean to be born again? He says that it means that two male and female have to become one flesh. We have to transcend our finiteness, finite consciousness of male and female to experience our oneness. That is divine consciousness. We will talk a little bit more about it, but let me uh, uh, point that uh, this sexual mysticism or Gnosticism, which we will discuss a little bit more during Q&A, um, is actually the heart of Tantra. This was the heart of the Guru movement and in fact, Tantra was the state religion of most Hindu kingdoms in India. There were Buddhist kingdoms. But the word Hindu and Hinduism is a new word. It is a creation of the Western Indologist, the first person to use the word, first Indian to use the word Hinduism is Raja Ram Mohan Roy and that happens only in the beginning of the uh, 19th century when the word Hinduism is accepted by the Hindus, but it is a word which is coined by the Westerners. But most of the temples which the kings were building, the state temples, they were all tantric temples as in Khajuraho in North India, Central India, um, close to where um, Rajneesh was teaching and in South India in uh, particularly in Madurai, thousand pillar temple etcetera, where you have erotic sculpture of gods and goddesses, male and female in uh, what today would be called pornography. In explicit sexual intercourse in the temple, because the temple would have platforms where uh, kings and nobility uh, will be performing sex with the priests and with uh, temple prostitutes called Devadasis. Uh, so, th so, th so, this was very much Tantra was is what is called Hinduism today during pre-Mughal uh, pre temple and because most many of these temples had these erotic sculpture with temple prostitutes called Devadasis, uh, Muslim invaders saw this not as religion, but as debauchery and destroyed most of those temples. Some temples survived which are visited by plane loads of tourist, tourists every, every day, but uh, let us uh, uh, let me make this point that um, homosexuality is Hinduism's philosophical triumph in the West by saying that one of the most famous deity in South India is Ayappa and uh, he is son of Shiva and Vishnu. Both are male gods, male deities, but Vishnu in this case also experiences her femininity which is Mohini. So, he is born of two male gods uh, Shiva and Vishnu and he is worshipped and there is a lot of controversy because uh, the women not, were not allowed until 10 years ago to even go for, to worship Ayyappan because this is all male affair. He is born of two male gods, he is male etcetera. But the 
the fact that the guru movement uh, brought homosexuality publicly into uh, it, it was not the first movement that brings homosexuality to the west uh, the respectability to LGBTQ, but the first person which I study in this book, book um, uh, and the, the most powerful, most influential with the largest following was Satya Sai Baba. Uh, he is n not there anymore, but uh, his, his top American follower for a long time was Tal Brook. Tal Brook wrote this book the avatar of night which was published by uh, Vikas publishing house which was Asia's largest publisher at that time. And in this book Talbrook explained of his own first hand homosexual encounters with Satya Sai Baba. Following that uh, a number of men uh, who had uh, homosexual relations with Sai Baba or Sai Baba initiated them into homosexual sex. Uh, they wrote on Facebook, uh, they wrote, wrote on the internet, there was a whole website or several websites, I have not checked if they are still there. Uh, but uh, so Satya Sai Baba, uh, th this book was published in England later as the Lord of the Air, because the word avatar was not understood in the West until um, uh, James Cameron made his movie Avatar. So, the British publisher changed the title to the Lord of the Air, which is a biblical title that Satan is Lord of the Air. Uh, so, that was the title that uh, British publishers used. Now, um, my other guru that I study in this uh, book, The World of Gurus is called Swami Muktananda of Ganeshpuri near Mumbai, at that time Bombay. He was the one who taught the most explicitly about the Kundalini Yoga and his own version of yoga he called Siddha Yoga, perfect yoga. He was enlightened by naked guru um, who was sitting on a, peel, uh, a pile of human excreta outside a city. Back then we did not have uh, flush systems or, or uh, sanitation systems. So, uh, people, the uh, middle class, upper class families, uh, they everybody went out um, uh, for toilet, uh, but the uh, uh, richer families had an outhouse for toilet, uh, where there was would be a tin under it. You sat on it, and uh, a woman will come, a sweeper woman, woman will come, and she will take the excreta, put it on a um, basket, dump it outside the city it will be stinking and filthy. Swami Muktananda was looking for an enlightened guru who has become one with everything. And he was disappointed, he went, to, he, he went to all the holy places in India in search of these gurus and did not find an enlightened person until he saw this naked ascetic sitting on this human filth, where you would not want to go near there, he was sitting in there, he was in bliss he would become one with everything including the filthiest thing. So, Swami Muktananda realized that he, re he really is a realized soul and asked him for initiation into his own self realization that I am God, I am one with everything, this is infinite consciousness. So, this guru asked Muktananda to strip, sit on his lap, he manipulated his genitalia to give him, awaken his kundalini and give him the experience of his own divinity. Then hundreds of thousands of, if not millions of western uh, university students and scholars started going uh, to Swami Muktananda for enlightenment, for awakening of their kundalini and there were real supernatural powers there which I have discussed in my book. But uh, the uh, third guru that I might mention in passing is Mah Maharshi Mahesh Yogi whom I study. He was uh, made very popular by the Beatles who began to follow him in 1967-68. They went to his ashram in Rishikesh. I went there after they had already renounced and left. 
I took, took initiation personally into transcendental meditation in Mahesh Yogi's living room. Uh, he was not there, but his uh, president of the Indian unit was there who initiated me. So, the Beatles went there, they donated a lot of money and that became a very famous ashram, uh, but they were disillusioned because uh, Mia Farrow, one of the Hollywood actresses, she was there um, and reported of the sexual advances that um, Mahesh Yogi had been making, making towards her and then uh, other women reported of the um, uh, sexual he called himself a celibate, but he was sleeping around with these women, the western women and as Beatles found these out, heard these things, they got very disgusted and disillusioned because they had given worldwide publicity to Mahesh Yogi and transcendental meditation. Uh, what th 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 their anger was unjustified because they were misled by the word celibacy. Celibacy is a Roman Catholic concept which means renouncing sex. In India, what is called celibacy is actually brahmacharya. The word is brahmacharya. It means harnessing sexual energy to become brahma, to become god. That is the tantric word. It is uh, deliberately uh, mistranslated uh, to deceive people, but Beatles believed it that Mahesh Yogi is celibate. So, uh, they followed him, but he was, they realized that he is using them to make a lot of money. Uh, and then uh, Lennon, one of the songwriters for Beatles, he wrote this song which is known as Sexy Sadie. Originally, this was Sexy Maharshi, Sexy Sadhu, but uh, um, Harrison, who also left Mahesh Yogi to follow Hare Krishna. Uh, he was the one who obj objected to uh, such a public uh, denunciation of their guru whom they have revered and built up and therefore the title of the song was changed from Maharshi to Sexy Sadie. But um, uh, th these are gurus who are bringing the concept of sexual revolution uh, and the oneness of male and female, that male and female dualism of male and female is an illusion. These are the gurus who are bringing this idea into 70s, 80s. Now, today's professors in our universities, the media writers, the politicians and judges who are accepting this philosophy do not know what has changed. The pastors who are very angry, the apologists who are very angry and quoting the Bible to condemn this whole movement, they do not know what has happened to the western culture uh, because they do not study this history of how is it that <coughs> the philosophy guiding our intelligentsia <coughs> changed so fundamentally. Now, let me look at just two or three of the academic works. These were the popular gurus, but this is not just a popular guru movement. The first book is by a professor in uh, Chicago University, Jeffrey Kripal. His book is called Kali Child which is a study of the erotic mysticism of Ramakrishna Paramahansa, who was the guru that initiated Swami Vivekananda. It was Swami Vivekananda who brought Hinduism into the US in 1893, first parliament of world religions which made him a big hit and he is revered in India. Therefore, to point out that his guru Ramakrishna Paramahansa had homosexual relationships with Swami Vivekananda. Uh, Ramakrishna's language is so uh, adult or uh, which uh, today YouTube, Facebook uh, will not permit that language. And one of his famous saying for example is he is worshipper of Kali, he sees God in the vagina, um, things like that. Now, that is a nice uh, polite way of putting the kind of teachings uh, that he gave. But the second uh, academic work which is still controversial and under uh, dispute is that when Mahatma Gandhi renounced his wife um, Kasturba in South Africa, this was because he had fallen in love with Herman 
a Jewish bodybuilder who was there in South Africa and they exchanged tons of letters, uh, love letters between them which have been now been bought by the government of India because one of his uh, grand niece or someone auctioned those letters and the government of India bought it and those letters are being studied. So, the book The Great Soul um, which is written by a Pulsar Prize winning uh, award winning writer which uh, Joseph um, <coughs> which has been actually banned by <coughs> Mahatma Gandhi's own state <coughs> of Gujarat that book is banned that is exploring on the basis of these letters and other, other correspondence that and the reason Mahatma Gandhi renounced his wife because he was experimenting sexual mist sex uh, homosexual sex with his boyfriend Herman. Now, internet is full of these you can check that out, but the latest controversy about great uh, uh, heroes of India uh, the congress party which is a political party in India published a small book just a few months ago. Uh, Veer Savarkar Kitne Veer, how brave uh, was Veer Savarkar the founder of Hindu Mahasabha and the booklet points out uh, that Godse who assassinated Mahatma Gandhi for religious reasons, political reasons, uh, he actually had homo homosexual relationship with Savarkar. Now, this information was first made public in the, the classic book Freedom at Midnight, which deals with uh, the uh, India's freedom 75 years ago on the midnight of uh, August 14th and 15th, India became free from the British Raj and India plunged into a massive genocide of Muslims and Hindus and Sikhs killing each other. Gandhi was fighting for peace, uh, fasting for peace, working for peace. Uh, and reconciliation. So, the book begins with those scenes, but at that very time Mahatma Gandhi was sleeping with two naked young women, his own nieces and he was writing about his sexual experiments himself that he is uh, testing his brahmacharya, practicing his brahmacharya, but popularly <coughs> what he was writing in his own newspapers. So, this information that Savarkar the founder of Hindu Mahasabha which morphed into the party that is ruling India now, the militant Hindu party, he was actually had a physical relationship with, uh, with Godse who assassinated Mahatma Gandhi. This information uh, comes from Freedom at Midnight which has been an extremely powerful well known book. Um, I will leave, leave you to uh, search uh, the internet to find those things, but the point that I made so far is that Hindu gurus including public figures such as Vivekananda Mahatma Gandhi were, bring, uh, were bringing this idea that male and female is within everyone by harnessing our sexual energy awakening our kundalini, we can actually experience divinity and this idea that God created us male and female distinct, I am male, I am not a female, that this is biblical illusion, mistake, uh, we are actually one. Now, all of this philosophy that I have explained very briefly although was fictionalized by Dan Brown in his novel The Da Vinci Code. The Da Vinci Code is uh, the painter Da Vinci in the 16th century in Paris. He painted the Last Supper. In the Last Supper on the right hand side of Jesus is uh, John, the apostle John. Da Vinci wrote that himself and so the church has always, every all art, art historians have always believed that this is John sitting next to Jesus, the beloved disciple. But Dan Brown says that no, actually Da Vinci wrote secret codes to point out that this is not John, this is Mary Magdalene. And according to this novel, and novel you have to understand, read the novel, not watch the movie if you want to understand what Dan Brown is saying, because movie removes the critical information 
that Da Vinci Code is a tantric uh, philosophy which Dan Brown baptizes in Christ's name, that the Last Supper was a tantric ritual that he calls Gnostic ritual in which Jesus has sex with Mary Magdalene and it is her menstrual blood and Jesus' own semen fused together that he gives to the disciples as his body and her blood or their body and blood which is the source of life back then in the 16th, 17th, 17th century they did not have an understanding of sperm and egg. So, they thought that it is the blood uh, from a woman and uh, semen uh, from a male uh, that produces life and Jesus is offering eternal life, abundant life through this ritual, uh, rit sexual ritual. That is what uh, Dan Brown is saying. Now, since most Christians were disgusted with the novel, they did not read the novel, uh, they do not understand what has happened in culture that these ideas, tantric ideas, sexual mysticism has become widely respected and accepted even if it is not understood. Now, the question is how did the Bible's worldview that creator and creation are distinct, creation, creator is separate from the creation. He existed before the creation existed, he created uh, the universe outside of himself. Uh, uh, how was this biblical world view uh, of dualism of creator and creation dis disbanded and monism accepted that actually all is one, creation is the creator, creation is evolving into man, dust is becoming human being. Well, we will have more discussion of this in during Q and A. Right now, it is enough to say that one development happened in science. In the 19th century science, physics and chemistry were two different departments energy was energy, chemistry dealt with matter, physics dealt with energy, chemistry dealt with matter, two could not be mixed because atom could not be broken, atom is eternal, it is imperishable, it cannot be destroyed. Einstein's equation energy equals mass times speed of light uh, squared. So, if you break x amount of uh, atom, you will get so much energy. This suggests that all matter may be actually one energy. So, suddenly 101, 103 whatever number of elements of chemistry become one energy potentially. All is one, one energy. Therefore, in 1980s, 1990s, the word energy was very common in the western culture and particularly it came from the new age movement. What is this energy? In his book, The Phenomenon of Man, uh, a Jesuit paleontologist, uh, Tilharde Sharde, he argued that uh, he is a paleontologist, he is a Roman Catholic priest, Jesuit, and, uh, but he is a biologist. He believes that evolution is real. But what is evolving? Obviously, when human beings are weaker than elephants or camels or horses, so physical strength is not evolving. We cannot fly uh, up in the air, so we are not as evolved as the birds are when it comes to flying or we can't swim, swim under water, so we are not as evolved as the fish. What exactly is evolving? He argues that it is consciousness that is evolving. Ants have little bit of consciousness and lizards have little more and um, monkeys have lot more and we are self conscious beings. It is consciousness is evolving. Has the evolution of consciousness stopped? Tilhard says there is no reason to assume that 
uh, evolution of consciousness has stopped. What will be the next phase of evolution? Man cannot be the ultimate uh, end of evolution. If evolution, if consciousness is evolving, till Hardesharni says that the next phase of evolution will be man becoming God, experiencing his divinity. Because consciousness is alpha and omega, the beginning and the end. Now, he has a very simple argument that in my words, if in an experiment carbon and oxygen are interacting, you can get carbon monoxide which is CO, you can get carbon dioxide which is CO2, you can get carbon trioxide CO3, you are never going to get H2O or water. Why? Because there is no hydrogen in the equation. However, if hydrogen appears, uh, water appears in, in that experiment all of a sudden, then hydrogen must have been there from the beginning. You did not know it, but it was there if H2O has emerged. Now, what uh, uh, Tilhar Dashanda is saying is if consciousness has emerged during the process of evolution and we know it has emerged because we have consciousness however you understand it, then it is safe to assume that in fact consciousness has been guiding the whole process of evolution from the beginning. It must have been there in the beginning. So, he calls consciousness Jung's collective unconsciousness or Hindu's concept of Brahma. He calls it alpha the beginning and omega the end. Consciousness begins to evolve and will culminate in human beings becoming God. So far evolution has happened spontaneously. Now that we are self-conscious being, we can actually take control of our own evolution and through Gnosticism, mystical uh, exercises, meditation, yoga, we can become God. That is the point. So, through um, Einstein, Carl Jung uh, and uh, Tilhard Ashardi, this whole worldview shift happened when the western church was sleeping asking the state to educate students uh, that we are not responsible for uh, discipling nation, we are responsible to, to take souls into heaven, uh, let the state educate and since our seminaries knew nothing about what is being taught in the seminaries, uh, in the universities and in the intellectual uh, world that is being shaped by these forces that I have briefly described, uh, we have landed in this position that now everybody is waking up as Dennis mentioned at the beginning and we will discuss that later. Now, a lot of these things became part of the new age movement and one of the most important book, uh, books in the new age movement that summarized this by, was by Fritz of Capra. Uh, his brother Capra was the film producer in Hollywood. He was a physics teacher, a good physicist who became a mystic and he wrote this book, The Tao of Physics, uh, where you have the symbol of yin yang, uh, male and female, light and darkness being one. Um, this is actually a very brilliant exposition of tantric sexuality. So, here is a physicist, a first class physicist who has renounced modern science to become a mystic and his teachings. So, this book is of course not studied uh, very much now, uh, but this was one of the foundational pieces uh, along with uh, Marilyn Ferguson's The Aquarian Conspiracy. This was a foundational text uh, that brought these various streams of thought together to create the today's concept that science should lead us to sexual mysticism to experience our divinity to become God. Um, uh, now, once again to conclude with the point that I made at the beginning that 
it is actually Christian marriage which makes sex sacred. We have not discussed the impact of Darwin and uh, uh, naturalism uh, which we will do during discussion, but uh, it was Darwin's teaching that human being is a beast, we are an animal, bees do not marry. Uh, they live by their sexual urges and impulses and sleep around. Uh, human beings marry. Why do we marry? Because in the Bible, God makes man male and female for two of them to be one, not to be separated through separation, through divorce, through fights, through selling of your wife or uh, losing her in a gambling match, um, putting her on the bid etcetera. In the many ways you can give up your wife, but the two of you are to take care of each other uh, for the rest of your life until death do us part in sickness or in death. Now, what does that mean? It means that the Bible's idea of marriage is based on a Trinitarian view of God and man. So, Bible begins by saying in the beginning, God created heavens and the earth, spirit of God was moving over the waters, hovering over the waters, the word of God began to create the universe, let there be light, let us make man in our image. So, he makes man male and female to be one. Now, Jungian perspective on the Bible say that will say that Adam was not a finite male. Adam is an infinite consciousness out of which female comes, male comes. So, male and female, uh, the, the problem is how does that consciousness actually become flesh and blood? The idea that actually God takes clay makes a man, makes a woman from him, that there is real flesh and blood. Physical aspect of gender and sexuality is important and we will have more of the discussion of this of gender and bisexual plants and animals during Q and A, uh, but that is part of the biblical worldview. When the two become one flesh they are able to have become three, have children and I am made in God's image, but I am finite. I become more of God's image when I choose to love my wife, become one with her and today incidentally is my 47th wedding anniversary and uh, when two of us become one and when we become three, we become more like God because it is I understand what God is. When 2 o'clock in the morning my wife wakes me up and says that you get up change the diaper of the baby that is crying. I have not heard the baby crying, but I get up change the diaper, uh, warm the bottle. In those days we, we could not keep the water, uh, milk warm, feed the baby, walk around until the baby burps. And when I am, I have been fast asleep. But once I begin to sacrifice my sleep for my child, so that my wife can rest a little more because she is the one who is carrying most of the burden of bringing up children, that is when I understand the father heart of God, the mother heart of God and I become more like God. Now, family sanctifies us, changes us, transforms us into God's likeness. On the other hand, the culture that is anti-marriage, that is promoting separation for the littlest reason, divorce for no reason, rebellion of children, the children should rebel against their father, uh, they call you father and mother, your mother calls you a girl, no, 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 if you want to be a boy, you should become a boy, you do not have to talk to your mother about uh, start taking puberty blockers etcetera and we will give you surgery, we will chop off your breasts and give you an artificial penis which will not be a penis, but you will actually look like a boy. So, rebel, whatever the form of rebellion, all of these hurt 
family because they violate love which is God's image. God is love. Family binds us together. So, if the Christian biblical sexuality view of sex and marriage makes sex sacred because um, this makes us like God. What is called sex, sacred sex in Tantra is actually the opposite because it never makes two of them one flesh except for a moment of orgasm etc. So, thank you. Uh, you can find some of these books and many of my resources if you visit www.revelationmovement.com and we will have the next episode in which this uh, big picture that I have presented briefly, uh, we will dig into uh, break up and discuss various parts with Dennis leading us and then we will have a third discussion on the same topic uh, from an Indian Hindu uh, perspective. So, thank you very much. Uh, stay with us on Bible as Revolution, uh, Bible tamed pagan beastly sexuality to create the modern world including in India. And once more that battle is now being fought. Uh, this perversion as described in Romans 1 in Greek or Roman world has been successfully fought by the truth of God's word in the past and it can be fought and won again. Thank you.